talking about the effect that bupropion has on anxiety. And I feel like when people look into these things, they want simple answers. They want to know, is bupropion good for anxiety or is it bad for anxiety? And I'm sorry to say to my splitting prone friends that the answer isn't that simple. Um, and in this video, hopefully we're going to go into some of the more nuanced into things. So let's get to it. So to start, why do we just assume that bupropion is bad for anxiety? I actually feel like that's one of the like hardcore facts you learn at med school. Um, I feel like you learn like very simplistic, you know, big universal facts like bupropion is bad for anxiety or DBT treats borderline personality disorder or SSRIs shouldn't be used in bipolar because they can cause a switch to mania. And when you actually look into it, things are usually not that simple. So the reason why I think it's kind of psychiatric lore that bupropion is bad for anxiety is that most people believe that low serotonin is involved in anxiety, whereas dopamine and norepinephrine are more involved in things like mood, motivation, and energy, but they don't really help with or possibly worsen anxiety. And this is sort of the foundation of the monoamine theory of depression and you know, anxiety and kind of mental illness. And you may be wondering, so if that isn't actually true, does that mean that that theory is incorrect? And to answer that, I think it's helpful to remember that there's a million theories as to what's going on in depression and anxiety. There's the monoamine theory, there's the inflammation theory, there's the HPA axis theory, there's the neurogenesis theory, um, there's interpersonal theories, and all these cognitive theories. And all these theories have different evidence and reasons as to why certain antidepressants work or how they, what they're doing to a person. And here, I think it's helpful to remember the quote, all models are wrong, but some are helpful. So all these theories are incorrect in some areas and correct in other areas. Um, and sometimes they're useful and sometimes they're not. So you use them when they're useful and you stop using them when they're not useful. So the way psychiatric theories work kind of reminds me of the parable of the elephant. Do you know that one? I'll, I'll just tell it to you. So the gist is that there's a group of blind men and they find out that this strange animal they never heard of called an elephant is coming to town. Um, and they all decide that they're gonna touch it to feel kind of what the animal is. And the one blind dude touches its trunk and it's like, yo, this is a big thick snake. And then the other blind guy touches his ear and it's like, I think this is like a big butterfly. And then the other blind guy touches his leg and it's like, I think this is like a giraffe. And then the other guy touches his tail and it's like, I think this is like a big worm. Um, and then like they all fight and hurt each other or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's roughly it. But the gist of the parable is that everyone comes at the truth from their own lens and they don't see the lens of the other people. And they think that their tiny lens is the whole truth when really it's too complicated for any one person to really, any one blind person in this case, I guess, to really know. But yeah, so then people ignore other people's experiences and then they fight because they're not able to see that uh, other people's point of views. And that's the problem with competing psychiatric theories. Or not the problem, I don't know. We have different lenses and you need to know when to use what lenses, I guess. So that was just a really convoluted way of saying that if you were to predict Wellbutrin's effects just from norepinephrine and dopamine based on the serotonergic hypothesis that you wouldn't expect it to be better in anxiety. But then the thing I'm alluding to is that maybe that's not a perfectly good theory here. So let's talk about the actual effects. So to get started, what exactly is anxiety? So anxiety is a universal human experience. Um, it's characterized by fear related things like worry, apprehension, tension, nervousness. Um, there's a whole bunch of them on the DSM. I never am able to remember the different ones because they're all synonyms for anxiety to me. But I think some people need to learn that anxiety is normal. Um, it's expected and it's an adaptive phenomenon. By itself, it's not dangerous or harmful. I think I do see a decent amount of people who just wanna get rid of their anxiety um, and think that it's just something that is an annoyance to them. And they don't give credence to the fact that maybe the anxiety is trying to communicate that something in their life is out of sync with um, you know, their values or their body or uh, I think it's important for people to appreciate that sometimes anxiety is trying to communicate important information to us. But with all that said, we define an anxiety disorder as people who regularly experience anxiety that is irrational or out of proportion to the situation. And who determines that? 
psychiatrist, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's a vague way of looking at it, but, um, you know, that's, that's how we have to approach it. So the way the DSM classifies it is that there are certain diagnoses that fit under the anxiety type disorders. That's like, you know, your generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia, and a few other ones. And then there are other disorders that aren't characterized under the anxiety disorders, but definitely have a major anxiety component. Um, there's a subtype of depression that's like an anxious depression, and then there's, you know, OCD has a huge anxiety component to it. So to get started, let's talk about the effect that bupropion has on anxious depression. Um, I think it's helpful to know that when people get depressed, they often have, they often get more anxious compared to their non-depressed self. Um, if this happens, it doesn't necessarily mean you have an anxiety disorder. However, if you have an anxiety disorder, it may worsen if you're also depressed. Um, so depressed people who have higher anxiety while they're depressed are said to have anxious depression. And they may or may not also meet criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. Does that make sense? So all I'm saying is that some depressed people experience anxiety as a symptom of their depression, but they don't have an underlying anxiety disorder. Um, so when they're depressed, they get more anxious, but they also may have an anxiety disorder. I, yeah. So they did a meta-analysis of 10 different papers looking at anxious depression, and that's uh, anxiety that occurs during a depressive episode. So the participants were split up into two categories. So there was the anxious depression category and then the non-anxious depression category. And then they looked at the effect of bupropion and SSRI in the one group and the effect of bupropion versus SSRI in the other group. So what did they find? For non-anxious depression, they didn't find a statistically significant difference. So bupropion was equal to SSRIs for non-anxious depression. And then for patients with anxious depression, they saw a slightly higher response rate when taking SSRIs compared to bupropion um, for both depression and anxiety measures. But when you look at the response rates for both the depression and the anxiety, the percentages aren't that different. So for anxious depression with SSRIs, you saw a 65% response rate. And then with bupropion, a 59% response rate. And then with regards to the anxiety, with the SSRIs, you saw a 61% response rate. And with bupropion, you saw a 54% response rate. So yeah, even though statistically significant difference between the two groups, the clinical relevance of that percentage is probably pretty minimal. And then there's a statistic called the number needed to treat. And here, the number needed to treat was 17. So I'd say that again, you need to treat 17 people uh, with an SSRI and Wellbutrin to see one additional responder from the SSRI compared to Wellbutrin. And then it's probably helpful to know that the UK's NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, sets an NNT of 10 as a potentially useful intervention. And then a number less than 10 is a potentially tolerable intervention. So yeah, the clinical relevance of that is definitely questionable. Um, there really were no differences between SSRIs and bupropion in terms of remission rates for depression or anxiety. So for anxious depression, SSRIs possess at most a very, very slight advantage over bupropion. So now you may be wondering what about anxiety as a result of generalized anxiety disorder, so not the depressive component. Well, there was a really small study in 2001 that compared Lexapro and bupropion, and there was no differences so to summarize, it's sort of a myth that people who are depressed uh, taking bupropion, it won't help their anxiety. We saw the number needed to treat with 17 uh, people with an SSRI and 17 people with bupropion to see a difference. And that's a lot of people to hit with you know, the SSRI specific side effects, like you know reduced sex drive, just to see a very small benefit. And then in regards to generalized anxiety disorder, we don't have a ton of data, but we do have that one small study that says that Lexapro and bupropion were equal. And so now you may be wondering, is there maybe a small proportion of patients who have that worsening anxiety when they start bupropion? And that certainly is true that you do see patients who have treatment emergent anxiety as a result of the medication. But SSRIs are also known to cause treatment emergent anxiety in a small subsection of patients. So about one in 10 patients do have uh, an increase in anxiety when they start SSRIs. And that number is comparable to the people who have new emergent anxiety as a result of the bupropion. So I would say there is a risk of, you know, anxiety or agitation when you start these medications, but it's the same across bupropion and SSRIs.
And then looking at some of the other diagnoses associated with anxiety. So for social anxiety disorder, there's a really small study that only 10 patients finished the trial in, but it showed that five patients had a 50% reduction in social anxiety. And including all the dropouts, it had a 36% response rate, which is pretty good. And then for OCD, there was just a small open label study, so that just means it wasn't uh, blinded, so the patients knew what they were taking. Um, and it suggested a worsening of OCD. So there they looked at 12 patients and they looked at the Y box um, and they saw that four patients improved with a mean increase in 31% of their symptoms. And then eight patients experienced a worsening of their symptoms with a mean increase in their Y box of 21%. And then this study, you can look at each individual patient and see how they fared with the bupropion. So there they concluded that given that the majority of patients had a worsening of symptoms, that it's not an effective treatment for OCD. And they concluded that given that we see that OCD and tics are worsened with Ritalin, um, which is a similar, somewhat similar mechanism of action, um, it's not terribly surprising. And they also concluded that OCD seems to stand out as one of the only psych conditions that responds uniquely to changes in the serotonergic system. So yeah, sometimes the monoaminergic theory is appropriate lens to look at certain conditions. Um, and I think it's helpful to note that there were a subsection of patients who did improve, um, which kind of just goes to show that these diagnoses don't have a perfectly homogenous population. You know, certain people respond, some people get better on the same medications, they get worse despite the fact that it's the same diagnosis, which kind of just, you know, goes to show the complexity of, of these diagnoses and mental health. And then for panic disorder, again, we just have a really small study to look at. Um, they looked at 20 patients. They did find a statistically significant reduction of one to two points in the primary outcome, which was the CGI severity scale. Um, and they also saw improvements in other panic measures, uh, like number of panic attacks in the last two weeks um, and the panic disorder severity scale. And there they concluded that it may be effective, but didn't really conclusively show that it's a great medication for panic disorder. So to summarize everything, it seems to be strong evidence that uh, bupropion and SSRIs are equally effective at treating non-anxious depression. Um, there seems to be strong evidence to suggest that uh, bupropion is effective at reducing anxiety during a depressive episode. And I think it's fair to say that bupropion doesn't cause more anxiety than SSRIs on average. And we actually know that all the antidepressants, um, there's a small subsection of patients that have worsening anxiety, and it seems to be at about an equal rate. And then there's preliminary evidence that bupropion may be effective in treating generalized anxiety disorder and social anxiety disorder, but the studies are 20 years old and are really small. So in conclusion, the SSRIs might have a very slight advantage over Wellbutrin, but if someone's suffering from anxious depression or depression associated with generalized anxiety disorder or social anxiety disorder, um, they shouldn't be condemned to taking pills that we know have side effects that a lot of people are opposed to like the sexual side effects or the you know, numbing of emotions, um, which are sometimes associated with SSRIs. And to wrap things up, I don't actually think that people are wrong if they're going to reach for an SSRI before bupropion, if they see anxiety or anxiety associated with depression. Um, you know, what people see clinically often differs a lot from what we see in studies. And a lot of this stuff is drawing from studies that are pretty old and a really small number of patients. And you know, I still think I'm going to reach for the SSRIs before bupropion if I see, you know, your classic case of anxiety or classic case of depression. Um, but I think this is helpful to take in for when you're considering a patient who's really hesitant to start a medication that they know has side effects that they don't really want to have. And in my limited clinical experience, um, I do feel like I see a more profound response to the SSRIs than uh, Wellbutrin. Um, but I think when you look at the data that you shouldn't consider bupropion to be a medication that worsens anxiety. And then I'll end with one little, hopefully helpful clinical tidbit. So there is a strategy to reduce the risk of a treatment in emergent anxiety or the severity of anxiety. And the, the strategy is by starting the dose really low and going up really slowly on the dose. So bupropion comes in different uh, release mechanisms. There's bupropion instant release, sustained release, and the XL. Um, and they're all dosed differently. So the IR is given three times a day, 
the SR is given twice a day, and then the XL is given once a day. And the lowest possible dose of the XL is 150 milligrams. So one strategy is to start the patient on the IR at 75 milligrams. So if you have a patient that you're worried about having an increase in anxiety, you can start with the instant release and start at 75 milligrams and then raise by 75 milligrams each week until you get the target dose. And then at that point, switch over to the bupropion XL formulation. So if you do that, you're giving the patient a little bit more time to get used to the medication and reduce uh, you know, the treatment emergent anxiety. So you know, start low and go slow. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching.